Hey friends, it's Becky L. McCoy, and this is Sucker Punched. This is episode 61 of Sucker Punched, and it is officially December. <laughs> we're we're in Advent, um, Christmas is coming, and I think this is one of those moments in, in the year that people are just so afraid of burnout or are already burned out and still just trying to make Christmas um, magical. And I have been thinking about this a lot because we're talking about burnout. (laughs) Um, and I think this is why the practice of observing Advent has been really special for me. Um, if you are in, in a Christian community, um, that follows the liturgical calendar, you are, accustomed to following Advent. And that just means that for the four weeks before Christmas, you are meditating on and uh, listening to music that focuses on the the hope and the longing of the Christmas that's coming. Um, and so it's instead of spending these next few weeks just being inundated by Christmas everything. Uh, And then Christmas comes and you're kind of burned out and let down. You're spending the next four weeks just building the anticipation of hope. And um, people like Tish Oxenreiter have wonderful Advent playlists on Spotify because there are songs and carols just for Advent. Um. And so it's really helped me to decorate the house slowly to uh, just, I guess, ponder is the right word. We don't use that word very often, do we? Um, but just to ponder, like, what what is Christmas? What does it mean to me? What um, What is going on in my heart and why do I even need Christmas at all? Um has been really helpful for Christmas to not be burnout central, right? (laughs) The fast train to burnout town. Um, I think something else that would be really helpful for you would be to listen to episode 59 when I talked to Becky Kaiser about uh, how do we approach holidays in a way that keeps them sacred, which just means special, uh, without it becoming something that we just kind of dread because it's not fun or exciting. It's just work. Uh, we had a wonderful conversation. Her book is also wonderful. I think if if this is something that you think about or you're um, wanting to make some changes in how you approach Christmas and other holidays, you should definitely check out that episode and check out her book. Also, I have written some thoughts on the blog about burnout, and soon there will be a post up there about my thoughts about burnout and Christmas and why Advent has been so special for me. So you can just head to beckylmccoy.com and find those. I really hope that those words can be an encouragement to you um, that that's why I continue to create content is just because I want you to be encouraged that there's not a right way that you can learn to, to be brave and confident in how you handle hard things in a way that is right for you and your family and your life. And, uh, not because there's any prescribed way to do it because really there are so few things that there's a right way <laughs> to approach it. And and yet um, we feel a lot of pressure to do things the quote unquote right way. So I hope um, that the work that I'm doing is encouraging to you. If it is, would you please consider supporting me on Patreon? It's a way that you can give just a little bit of money every month. It could be like $3 a month. Um 
to the people who are creating things that you love. And it helps us to not just pay the bills, but to create some margin in our own lives to do more creating. And um, I support a few people on Patreon as well. And it's just, it's really wonderful to get to know them and interact with them in a different and more intimate way. So um, today I am talking with Darina Lazo Gilmore. She was widowed at a young age as well. And um, it is just so, I always think it's so fascinating to see how people handle their grief. And so we're talking today about what it looks like to burn out, not just in grief, but as a caregiver. And I think this is a really important conversation, whether you've ever been the caregiver or not, I think you'll get some insight into how to love on and care for the people in your life that, that are being caregivers and how to help them not burn out and how to support and encourage your friends who are grieving and help them not to burn out as well. As Darina says, it takes a lot of courage to rest. And I think that is so true. So here's my conversation with Darina. Welcome, friends. I am here today with Darina Lazo Gilmore, and we're going to talk some more about burnout. <laughs> Thank you for being here with us today. I'm so grateful to be part of this conversation with you. Thanks. So, um, we we're just going to kind of explore what burnout has looked like in your own life. Um, so, what what if you were kind of taking a bird's eye view of your own life and you're thinking about a moment when you've been burned out, what does that look like? How is your life different when you're feeling burned out compared to when you're not? That's such a good question. You know, I was reflecting on that and thinking about um, just some of the emotions and I guess um, reactions that come out in a season or a day or a moment of burnout. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, um, it looks like fatigue. I get more frustrated easily and I, I feel like I tend to forget things. Um, I'm a pretty high capacity person. I always have been. I feel like um, for many years I wore my ability to multitask as a badge of honor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which I don't do anymore. <laughs> Um, and so just, you know, kind of that mode of striving and hustling and pushing to accomplish and checking things off the list, that is a default mode for me. And if I allow myself to be in that mode too long, it definitely looks like burnout. Um, so I'm sure some of your listeners are, um, familiar with the Enneagram. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I've heard you talk about it before on the show and in the Enneagram, I'm a seven. So that's the enthusiast, um, yep. joy and hope and adventure. And all of those things are, are natural for me. They are what I gravitate towards when I'm healthy. Um, but when I am stressed, I push towards the number one, which is perfectionism. And mm -hmm. so when I see myself like starting to get just really bothered by things not being perfect. I know that I'm in the burnout, like little zone. <laughs> yeah. We talked about, um, in the, in the first two episodes of this burnout series, uh, Chantel Reynolds and I talked a little bit about the Enneagram and how for both of us, it's been such a useful tool to like, okay, red flag. <laughs> I must be stressed because this is how I'm reacting to things. Um, so I'm glad that you brought that up because it really is super helpful. Um, what does it, what does burnout feel like for you? Yeah. I mean, I kind of was saying it a little bit before, but I think for me, it, um, it looks like a frustration because I can't get enough done. Um, but it also looks like fatigue, um, when I am getting things done, Mm -hmm. I just don't have that normal joy that is um, like inherent in my personality. 
And so I feel disconnected from people and I'm, I'm definitely an extrovert and a people person. I feel like I'm, I'm questioning and wondering like, where are you, God? What are you doing? And I spend a lot more time worrying and stressing about the future. That's really interesting because a seven is usually like super in the moment and Mm -hmm. like making the most of whatever is happening right now. So you recognize that when you're getting into burnout, your thoughts kind of shift away from the present a little more. Yeah. And that's why I think Enneagram has been so helpful because it just has given me language to identify some of those kind of red flags. Mm hmm. Yeah, this was like wasn't meant to be like the Enneagram series <laughs> of the podcast, but it's kind of turning into it because it seems like we've all just found it to be a useful tool. <laughs> um, so can you think of any specific seasons or stories of burnout from your own life? You know, I have several, but I'm pro- I'm going to share probably the most um profound and hardest season of burnout for me. And that was in 2014. Um, Just a little bit of context. My husband and I, um, we were helping to run a nonprofit organization in Haiti. So our home base is in California. We were doing a lot of traveling back and forth to Haiti. Um, I had helped start a fair trade jewelry project called the Haitian Bead Project. And so I was managing um, kind of sales and marketing and communication volunteers here on the U.S. side in California, and then um, traveling a few times a year to catch up with the artisans. So it was just a really busy season of life. And Mm. that year, um, even though we felt like we were very much in our sweet spot in terms of ministry and work, um, we had three daughters and they were in school and just kind of juggling all of the things. And that was the year that my husband was turning 40. So he's a real goals oriented athletic type of person. And he had written down all of these different things that he wanted to do that year to celebrate his 40th birthday. So he was running a marathon and he was participating in an Ironman race and he's a CrossFit guy. So he was like, participating in the CrossFit games. He was doing all these things, which were fun for him and kind of a marker for him, like 40 and celebrating. Um, But during that time, we noticed that he had this bump that was growing on his leg. And in talking with some different medical professionals and physical therapist friends, most people thought it was some sort of sports injury because he had been involved in so many sports and athletic things. Um, and his birthday was in April. So just kind of through those first few months of the year, we were watching that and thinking he had this sports injury, but he really wasn't in a lot of pain. Um, and then eventually our doctor ordered testing and he got a PET scan and long story short, we, found out in May of that year that he actually had a tumor growing on his leg. Um, and he was diagnosed with melanoma cancer. So our striving and our crazy busy life came to a screeching halt. Um, and we canceled our, all our trips to Haiti that year. We had several different churches that were going to be going with us. We were going to be living there for the summer with the kids. And we had to really just like, clear our plates completely and go into basically crisis mode, which was, you know, exploring treatments and meeting with doctors. And I became his caregiver. Um, so it was Mm -hmm. a different type of work than I was used to, obviously just had no background at all with that. Um, but it was a really intense season from basically May until September that I was, caring for him around the clock. Um, and he graduated to heaven in September of 2014. So that season for me was definitely a season of burnout. I mean, I literally did not sleep longer than two hours at a time because I was caring for him and I had three daughters. So just trying to manage them and just hundreds of people who were reaching out to us. Um, so it was a strange, thing that, you know, I, I 
obviously was grieving my husband's death, but in his death in September, I felt this strange and unexpected relief because he was no longer suffering. And I knew I had to pivot to starting to take care of myself because I was completely burned out. Yep. And I know you can relate to some of that too. So, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sitting here nodding my head like, yeah, this sounds really familiar. Yeah. Cause like you said, when you're a caregiver, like you're, you're not sleeping a lot and that could just be the stress or because every two hours you have to get up and help someone with medication or, you know, the list goes on and on and on and on of all the things that your mind is juggling um, to care for someone. So, um, like you said, when he passed away, there was this feeling of relief because the, the burden of caregiving was now lifted. And how, how did you handle, um, that like moving, um, forward, like it, was it kind of a natural thing to move away from the burnout or, you know, I think I had this realization. It wasn't like a specific day or moment that I can remember, but I started to have this realization just how, how burned out I was and how physically, um, Mm -hmm. you know, I had lost a ton of weight. Like I said, I hadn't slept for months. If I ever had a break, which I had some really generous friends and family who would often try to, to give me a break, but I was full of so much anxiety that I, I could never like have that true rest. And so I kind of took mm-hmm. this evaluation of my life a couple of weeks after his funeral and looking at my three daughters and realizing like we are alive right now and this is our gift and we have the opportunity to live my husband's legacy. And I knew deep down somewhere that, you know, I needed to take care of myself and I didn't really know how to do that. I just had this sense of like, okay, Hmm. I need to nourish somehow. Um, and so what that looked like for me immediately is that I had to say no to some big things that were on my plate. And the biggest thing was that I stepped away from our nonprofit in Haiti. Um, I took myself off the board of directors and, you know, I was no longer the communications director And as far as the jewelry project that I was directing, I was able to pass it on to some other close friends who were already volunteers and friends really involved. Um, And so I had to remove all of those really big pieces from my plate in order to focus on myself and the girls. And honestly, that was really Mm -hmm. like one of the hardest decisions I made in my life because it was a secondary loss for me to step away from something that had been so life-giving and so connected to my husband and our, you know, really life mission, but I knew I just couldn't do it all. I I could not be traveling between countries and, you know, just directing so many things and really be present for my kids. And so it looked like saying no to some big things and then starting to say yes to things that were for us. Um, So we had some just wonderful friends who invited us, you know, to go on trips. We took some trips to the ocean. We live in California, so we're a couple couple hours away from the coast. Um, We just did some things as a family and leaned into our grief kind of together through that. Um, In -hmm. practical ways, I just, like, I had always been the helper. I had been the one who was serving others, especially in Haiti. And I had to really just say, I'm going to allow other people to help me. (laughs) I'm going to like let like people fed us for, I don't even know, probably three months Mm -hmm. because I was not Mm -hmm. feeding myself well (laughs) during those months of caregiving. And I needed my kids to be fed well, you know, and just the community that came with that also of just like eating meals together with friends and family um, was really important for us to kind of break through and realize like, we were not focused so much on being alone as we were of just um, grieving together with others. Mm -hmm. And how did you handle um, 
helping your kids grieve, but then also making sure that you were grieving too. Do you feel like they kind of naturally happened at the same time or did one have to happen before the other? You know, during this season, I don't know if I was really cognizant of it, but looking back, I just feel Mm -hmm. like God's grace was poured over us so much. And, And my biggest thing as a mother was I don't know how to make it better for them. And that's not even the goal. My goal was just to create a safe space for them to share their grief. And, you know, every kid is different and they are uniquely wired. And so, you know, I had at the time a two-year-old who was trying to process her daddy's death. And then I had a four-year-old and a seven-year-old. And my four-year-old is tends to be more emotional and expressive about that. And my mother-in-law, I remember her describing my middle daughter as like this piece of tissue paper, like being blown by the wind because she was so fragile during that time. Mm -hmm. And then my oldest, um, she just became my partner in parenting. And I didn't even mean for it to be that way, but she just was a firstborn responsible. She would help me with things around the house. And so she was a lot quieter about her grief. So I really had to be intentional Mm. about like asking her questions and giving space for like remembering daddy and, you know, doing those types of things. Um, Cause she, she dealt with her grief by, by doing and serving. Um, And Mm -hmm. so for me, it was, it was hard. I mean, suddenly, (laughs) suddenly I found myself to be a solo parent and a single mom. And I mean, coming out of a really strong marriage, like that was so hard for me to accept, like, okay, I have to do this on my own. Um, and there were a few ways that I tried to separate and like, just have some time to grieve apart from the girls. I mean, I spent so much time with them, but then there was, you know, my parents would watch them Mm -hmm. so I could go out with friends or I did a couple like weekend trips. I went to a conference, like those things were really important for me to just give me freedom to grieve Mm -hmm. without them. Um, but I, for the most part, we grieved together. What do you feel like the that those few months of being your husband's primary caregiver and then the grief because you just passed your four year mm-hmm. mark? Um, what do you feel like you have learned about how you need to handle burnout from those those two things? Yeah, you know, it has been such a such a journey. The answer, the, it, it could be, I don't know. <laughs> like, let's be real. <laughs> well, honestly, I feel like I've learned a lot. And I mean, as I look back over my entire life, I realized, wow, there was a lot of seasons where I was really burned out and I never accepted it. But because I can mm. see the grief journey that I went through and losing my husband, and I had to have like a hard stop after his death where it was like, okay, I have got to take care of myself because I have to take care of these girls. And so if mommy is not well, I'm not going to take care of them well. Um, So looking back, I just, um, I realized how much I needed to build in a rhythm of rest. um, And I needed to give myself first permission to rest. (laughs) And I did not grow. I grew up Mm -hmm. in a family where we were constantly chasing busy. And I'm so grateful for my parents. You know, both of them were Um, their parents were immigrants from Italy and then in the Philippines. And so I know that their heart and their intention was to give my brother and me like the best opportunities and the most opportunities. But I really believe that it was also kind of subconsciously training us in busyness. And so I had to do a lot of reflection in the last few years of how can I like create new grooves here and actually chase rest instead of chasing busyness Um, so that I can be healthy and I can be Mm -hmm. whole, um, for myself and for my kids. Um, so just looking back, you know, I just began to explore new ways that I could take care of myself and really connect to God in a quieter way, not, not serving God, but actually just being with God and being loved by him. Um, 
as it says in Isaiah, that he is my maker and my husband. And I clung to that verse so much because I realized like I did not physically have my husband anymore. I couldn't depend on him. I needed to depend on God um, as my husband and just kind of exploring more. What does it look like to rest in that? Um, so those are some of the things that I've really been learning. I'm not sure if that answers your your question. <laughs> Oh yeah, totally. <laughs> um, and and you've definitely been very intentional about learning these things because, like, you've written a few Bible studies on on the topic. And so, tell us a little bit more about um, kind of, I guess, the thesis of of, of what you want to share about what you've yeah, learned. Yeah, um, my first Bible study that I, that I wrote it's called Glory Chasers and. In 2014, my word theme for the year was glory. And so I had no idea, of course, what God was going to unfold with my husband's cancer journey. But I really felt like God was training me to to chase his glory, to look for his glory in really unexpected places. And I thought that was going to be just kind of in my everyday world as Mm -hmm. a mom. But what it ended up being was chasing his glory through the really dark days, through the hard times, through the trials, through the deep disappointment of my prayer not being answered, that my husband would be healed. Um, and just being able to understand God's glory, like in a more dynamic way. So the Bible study really is very narrative. It tells my story of going through that year and wrestling with that idea of God's glory. And then I ended up writing kind of a sequel one that's called flourishing together And that really is my journey of finding rest and realizing that God wants every one of us to flourish, not just some people to excel, but he wants all of us to just cultivate this fruitful life. And so for me, it was learning, um, you know, learning how to be planted again with like a whole new life that I wasn't expecting. Um, I actually got remarried in 2016 to by God's crazy design, (laughs) one of my late husband's best friends who is single, who had been a supporter of our ministry for many years, um, who ended up moving back to California in 2015. And Sean was absolutely instrumental in me learning how to rest. Um, he, he was a triathlon, um, coach and an Ironman athlete himself. And so I don't know if you're familiar with Ironman, but basically you run a full marathon, you swim like two and a half miles, and then you bike, you know, more than a hundred miles. And so it is horribly insane insane. (laughs) athletic feat. And the thing about him being an athlete is that rest was non-negotiable for him. And so when he came into the girls in my life, you know, I remember having this conversation with him at the beginning and it was so funny because I would be like, well, what do you do on the weekends? And he's like, well, I go for a long run on Saturdays and then I come home and I take a long nap. And on Sundays I go to church and I serve at my church and maybe go for a long bike ride. And then I come home and I take a long nap. And I just laughed at him like, what? (laughs) What is a nap? Like, I just didn't even understand that. And then especially after a year of like crisis and caregiving, it just wasn't even part of my understanding. And so I thought to myself, oh yeah, if this guy comes into our life, you know, we're like, he's going to have a wake up call (laughs) that, cause that's just not realistic. And the person (laughs) who was changed was me. Um, because for the first time in my life, I had someone who, Mm -hmm would con- congratulate me for taking time for myself. If I, if he came home from work and I said I had napped that afternoon cause I was tired, he was like excited. And I had never had that kind of permission before. And I don't believe rest is only napping and sleeping. I mean, there's mm-hmm. a lot of different nuances to that and it depends on how we're all wired. But I realized that his attitude about rest um, was just giving me that permission and was so life giving for me. And so even in seasons where God was pruning my life, where I was learning how to rest, where I was learning how to nourish myself in new ways, um, where he was cultivating new dreams in me. That was just so important. And having Sean as my partner was just a game changer in that um, because he, he understood it. He understood it in a functional way as an athlete, but he understood it also in a spiritual way that 
just was amazing. Hmm. So those are those are the two Bible studies, and that's kind of you know yeah that the is thesis neat. for flourishing together is helping each one of us find that fruitful life in Christ. And so it's you know my narrative drives the study, but by the same token, I want every person who does the Bible study to discover that for themselves. Yeah, that's really awesome. Um, it, I'm going to link to both of them in the show notes. So if people are interested, they can find them. Do you see there being any connection between dealing with burnout in your life and living bravely? You know, I've started to see this more recently um, as I've been trying to develop more um, rhythms of rest and kind of Sabbath rhythm for my family with Sean. And I realized um, that it takes a lot of courage to rest because it means that we fully have to trust God and we're not relying on our own strength and our own smarts and our own ideals. Like we actually have to be brave because especially in American culture, embracing rest is so countercultural. Like it's just, it's not part of what we do. And it certainly Mm -hmm. wasn't the training that I had in growing up. So um, I've been reading a book by Shelley Miller called Rhythms of Rest. And she has this amazing thing called the Sabbath Society. And she talks about that a lot in her book that we actually have to have courage um, to choose rest for our families. And, you know, some of that I think is because we have to say no to things because we have to take time to prepare to rest, um, because we have to, you know, sometimes disappoint people. And I never really thought about it before, but when I look around, you know, at my community, I realize, yeah, I have to do something that other people are not necessarily doing and I have to encourage them to come along. And so that takes bravery. Yeah, I love that. And now I'm going to have to go check that book out. I think it's 79 cents <laughs> on Amazon right now for the Kindle version. So <laughs> it's a good time to check it out. Yeah. There's like oh, a- man. <laughs> I apologize if this episode <laughs> is coming out after the sale is over. Um, <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing uh, with us today. And I know that there are going to be people out there that are in that same situation of caregiving and just not realizing yeah. how burnt out they are. Um, and, and also in grieving and having to figure out what, what it looks like to, to heal physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Thank you so much, Becky. I love what you're doing and just encouraging people through these topics too. Until this conversation, I had never thought about the idea of legacy and self-care being connected. Um, But it's so true. Having been in similar circumstances, um, I I do want to leave a legacy of self-care. I want to be able to do this kind of work and um, live my life and care for my children and my friends and my family for a long time. And that requires figuring out how to take care of myself in a way um, that I'm not constantly burning out. So I hope you were encouraged by that too. I, uh, one of the ways that I find I can care for myself is to go to retreats or conferences, um, just traveling on my own is really energizing for me, even if I don't talk to anybody (laughs) for days and days and days, introvert much. Um, but that's not, I mean, that's not something I can do every month or every other month even, or even, you know, more than once or twice a year. And maybe that's not something you can do at all. Uh, because of finances or time or not being able to take off of work or just your family situation. And uh, that's why I just love and get so excited about the Brave Together virtual retreat because you get to participate from home and you don't have to worry about traveling or taking off of work or finding childcare or... um, 
it just is a way for us to meet because we get to interact and and chat and get to know each other, uh, not face to face because it's not a video chat because we're all at home in our PJs on our couches and probably looking like hot messes, which is the idea. <laughs> but there's a chat room where we can type back and forth and make new friends and get to hear from really incredible speakers who have so much to share with us. And um, it is just so wonderful. And I'm so grateful for it. Uh, we are meeting next on February 23rd. It is the last Saturday in February. And we're going to be talking about dreaming and learning to dream again, because so many of us have forgotten how to do that, whether life has been too hard to dream, or maybe you've just been in a season of life where there's just no dreaming and that's okay and normal. And, and now it's time to learn how to do it again. So I'm really excited about that. You can head to my website to find out more about that. And I really hope that you get to come because it's going to be super wonderful. Next episode of Sucker Punched, I am talking with Seth Haynes. He's the author of the book called Coming Clean, and it's just dealing with uh, addiction and sobriety. And it's uh, really, I, he is one of those people that I want to support every single thing that he does because <laughs> he is so uh, creative in how he thinks through things and processes real life problems. And um, one of the things that he has been processing lately has been addiction to social media and how we burn out on it. And um and and we just had a really wonderful conversation. So that'll be uh, on the next episode of Sucker Punched. If you have a podcast, want to have a podcast, are thinking about wanting to have a podcast, <laughs> definitely check out ResonateRecordings.com. The people at Resonate Recordings are super helpful in the technical aspects of setting up a podcast, in the creative aspects of planning a podcast. And they make this podcast and so many other podcasts sound wonderful uh, week after week after week. So uh, they're wonderful to work with. I am so grateful for them <laughs> because uh, they are really good at what they do. So if you are interested, definitely check them out. Let them know that I sent you. This has been episode 61 of Sucker Punched. I'm so grateful that you have been sharing these conversations, sharing um, kind of your ear time with me. If you enjoy these conversations, please rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts or whatever app you're using to listen. It's super helpful in uh, all the algorithms that all of these apps are using to recommend podcasts to new listeners. And I know that when I want to find a new podcast, I head to the podcast I already love and see what other podcasts are recommended. And it's the ratings and the reviews that kind of determine what podcasts are suggested. So um, that would be an excellent Christmas present for me or any other podcasters that you listen to, to leave some ratings and reviews. All right, friends, I am looking forward to sharing my conversation with Seth Haynes with you on the next episode. Bye. Bye.